Well, we are back for another edition of the Sideline Scoop Post NFL Draft Edition, and we welcome in Jeremiah Searles. Buddy, how you doing? Did you survive? Are you recovered? How was your first draft as an agent? <laughs> it was it was so fun. It was so much fun. You know, it, it's extremely stressful because you want to make sure all your guys have a home. And I mean, I'm watching all the Husker players and a lot of invested in. I mean, I've invested a ton of time and effort and into these guys in the last four months. And, you know, you kind of feel like this is your Super Bowl as an agent, right? Everything your season has led up to this starting in January to now. This is all what's kind of led up to. And now you kind of get to go, okay, I did my part. Now it's time for these guys to go and play ball and get back after it. But Super stressful weekend, fulls of highs and lows, but you know, it, it was really, really fun. You feel like you can breathe yet? A little bit, you know, a little <laughs> bit. I think we all day on Sunday was uh, contract negotiation or no, contract going over contract. So learning a lot about that and how different teams word certain things and, you know, stuff you never worried about as a player, right? That's why you're like, oh, that's why I have an agent. Uh -huh. So now you're kind of on the back end, like looking through that stuff, like, okay, I see why they said this or what clause says that and all kinds of like the, behind the scenes piece of it. How much did you learn over the last three months? Oh, so much. I mean, so much, right? You, you, as a player, you're just kind of like, yeah, just show up and play. But as an agent, you learn kind of what the process is like, and you can't really know it unless you're in it, right? right? And the way that it goes is like it's a yearly cycle. It's just like a season. It all only happens once. The combine, the all-star games, the draft. Like, there's no prepping for it. It just happens, and then you just learn as you go. So I've learned so much about how the inner workings of the NFL draft go, how scouting goes, who's in charge of what, who to talk to, and – really how little the actual coaches have involvement in it, which is strange. Um, you know, it's so much more of a full scouting department and the personnel department and not as much the coaches. I think coaches kind of get the last, like, oh, here's who we're thinking you can get the watch piece of it. Like, who do you like out of these five guys? But, you know, so much of that is done by entirely different departments in each organization, which was really interesting to me. Was there one big thing that you learned that you didn't know that really was shocking or that you took away that – you know, again, you you didn't know as a player. You know, I, you tell people all the time, and, and we tell all our players too, like, hey, you know, draft weekend is the liars lies and the lies lie, <laughs> right? Like, it's just the truth. Like, and it's not in a bad way, but you know, there's the draft is an ever changing thing, and you'll be hearing one thing one thing oh, one second. And then all of a sudden, someone gets drafted, and you're like, wait, that phone hasn't rang from that guy anymore. He was really interested, and now he's gone. Oh, it's because they drafted a tight end, or they drafted a lineman, or whatever it was. And, you know, it's just it's constantly changing and evolving, and the draft in itself is like its own organism. It's really strange. So, overall, we're, we're going to dive into all the Huskers and, and their placements, but which NFL team won this year's draft, in your opinion? That's a tough one. You know, I think the easy answer is the Jets, right? I mean, they did so much early in the draft and trading up and getting Jordan Davis, and then they also get A.J. Brown from Tennessee, right? Like, they did a lot of big moves, but what people didn't see is their last draft pick was, like, the beginning of the fifth round, and then they had nothing. Mm -hmm. so they only drafted, like, four guys, which is fine, but at the same time, like, you, you're kind of going the L.A. Rams approach there of, like, F them picks, Right? You're just like, let's go get established people. But you can kind of lose out down the road on guys that are development to your team and how they go. But I think the Jets know that they need to win, and they need to win now. So I think they made some really good moves in that regard to try and get things going quickly, right? They got the quarterback last year in Wilson. Now they went and got him some weapons. They drafted a couple of linemen, right? Like, they, they did a lot of good things in the draft, in my opinion, especially on day one and day two. Okay, well, let's talk Huskers. And the first one off the board, as expected, was Cam Jurgens. How perfect is the fit for him in Philly? Uh, you couldn't ask for a better spot. I mean, Philly's been interested on him for a long time. I can tell you that. I've talked to plenty of people over there. You know, and, and then you see the video come out of Kelsey afterwards saying that he watched tape and he was in part of that. And you go, yep, makes sense. Kelsey and Jurgens are about as comparable as you can be as far as when it comes to what NFL centers in that scheme fit. So I think it's a good fit because Kelsey probably only has maybe one, two years left in him. So, you know, Cam doesn't have to come in and start right away. But I think that for him, a year to grow, a year to develop. And again, last year was Cam's first fully healthy year. So he's still learning and growing too. But this is a great position for him to be put in, a chance to contribute, become a starter and a longtime starter in this league. Yeah, Jason Kelsey, um, he said that he was his favorite, Cam was his favorite player in this entire draft, and that they were, they asked him to help maybe look at a potential center. And so, and he said watching his film, he just loved it. 
I mean, is it the athleticism? What take me into Jason Kelsey's mind and and why he thought Cam, why Cam was his favorite player in this draft? You know, it's it's easy because Jason Kelsey plays a lot like Cam. You know, I think, or you could say Cam plays like Jason Kelsey, whichever one, it's interchangeable. You know, Kelsey's constantly running downfield. He's so athletic. He's getting out on screens. He's really able to reach these noses. And you kind of compare, everyone loves the compare game in the NFL draft, right? Like, this guy reminds me of this guy. And those two dudes are like <laughs> mirrors of each other. And so you talk about it, and you look at it, and then you put up Kelsey tape, and you put up Jurgens tape, and you're like, yeah, I see why this fits. And so I think Kelsey was looking for a guy that when you're looking and you're retiring and you're lucky enough to be able to say, I'm going to retire in a year, and the game doesn't tell you when you have to retire, you want to leave your team with someone in good hands, right? And so I think through what the Eagles do and how unique Kelsey's skill set has been for them over the course of the last decade, that he wanted to find someone comparable to come in and try and fill, that sh fill those shoes when he eventually does leave. And I think Cam f checks a lot of the boxes for him when he watched his tape. Yeah, this could be completely off, but I was thinking about this too. So uh, Jalen Hurts led the NFL as, in rushing yards as a quarterback. He ran for more yards than any other quarterback. And who knows what their plan is long term with Jalen Hurts if Cam's and if they're there together for the whole time. But, you know, I've, I've had conversations with offensive linemen in the past, you know, going back to my days at Oklahoma when guys have, uh, you know, transitioned from mainly a guy that stands back there and passes to a guy that scrambles, like Baker Mayfield scrambled a lot, and then a guy like Kyler. So then you look at what Cam Jurgens did with Adrian Martinez, who ran a lot and wasn't just, you know, called design run plays all the time for a quarterback. How helpful can that be? So that you do have that experience in college protecting a guy that ran the football a lot as a quarterback. Yeah, you know, it's really good to be able to have that background, especially with the quarterbacks in the NFL moving to a little bit more of a, a movement quarterback's kind of what people are looking for now, right? The days of the Tom Brady, the Peyton Mannings, and the stand like a statue back there and deliver a ball is kind of phasing out because you're seeing the success that you can have with Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, Justin Herbert, these guys that are athletic enough to move. Well, when that's the case, you have to have offensive linemen that can move around with them. And so Cam does bring that bit of a unique skill set that he can move with the quarterbacks and he can pull out on, I mean, we pop protected him a lot, which means we pulled him from the center position and had to protect the edge on bootlegs or play action. So he brings a lot of movement pieces to it. And with Jalen Hurts being a quarterback that does run around, I think you're right. I think that does mirror his game a little bit better. But I will say this, they need to stop moving Jalen Hurts around so much or the <laughs> dude's going to die. You know, every NFL quarterback thinks they can run coming from college until about year two, year three, and you get absolutely lit up by a couple of these linebackers and safeties that are 30 years old. And you're like, ah, maybe I'll stay behind the O-lineman instead of run in front of them this time. It's crazy. So Lane Johnson, who is our left tackle, right? Or right tackle? Right. He's the right, right tackle. Right tackle. Okay. So he was at Oklahoma when I was at Oklahoma. And he was a high school quarterback, was a tight end, was a stud athlete too. And then Jason Kelsey, obviously, is a stud athlete. Is the Philadelphia offensive line the most athletic in the NFL now? You know, I think they, they're up there with it. You know, that's definitely a scouting piece that they use. They love measurables, and they love the combine numbers. And you'll hear certain teams that could give two craps with someone's 40 and pro agility <laughs> was. But then there's certain teams like the Eagles that pay a lot of attention to that because it's what they built themselves and what they feel builds them, brings them success. Every team's philosophy for success is different, which is something I also learned. Some guys really put a lot of emphasis on the combine more than film. Some people are like, I could care less what you did to the combine. It's more about who you are as a person and how you played. The Eagles love the numbers thing. And Cam, and give him credit and give his uh, people he trained with out in California and his agency credit, he crushed the pre-draft process. I mean, he absolutely crushed it, tested out of the wazoo, came to pro day in great shape, put together good tape. And like, you know, so it doesn't surprise me that he checked a lot of boxes for a team like the Eagles. All right. Cam Taylor Britt, next one off the board in the second round. Were you surprised that he went as early as he did and Cincinnati I moving up to go get him? You know, I was a little bit, but there was a big run of corners happening, right? You saw, I mean, from the first top five picks, you saw two corners go. And so that's the way the NFL works is it goes, the draft goes in runs, right? Runs of players where all of a sudden it's like all of a sudden two, three corners start going and teams that have a corner on their board that they think they can get in the third, they start to panic a little bit and they're like, oh, he might not be there. We really want him. Let's move up. And I think that's kind of what happened with Cam. And what Cam did this offseason, what Cam did this pre-draft process is he's one of the few 
big corners mm-hmm. that ran fast in this NFL draft, right? There's a lot of long, lanky corners. Cam is a put-together guy. You know, he's not afraid to be physical, and he went down to the Senior Bowl and showed his physicality running through receivers and tackling. And, you know, he does have some things to get tightened up and technique-wise and turning his hips and running with guys and staying with uh, letting not as much separation go. But, you know, I think that the measurables were all there, the tenacity, the off-the-field stuff where – the leadership and all that came in and all that led to him being able to go be a big time second rounder for the Bengals. And he got the call from Zach Taylor, a fellow Husker. I got emotional, Jeremiah. I kind of had some tears and just seeing what that moment meant to Cam and his family and he was speechless. Cam Taylor Britt's never speechless, but then seeing Zach Taylor be congratulated. Hey, we got your Husker. As a former Husker yourself, how special was that for you to see? Yeah, that was pretty dang cool. You know, I think anytime you get the Husker to Husker connection, it's always pretty special. And to to go somewhere that you have an instant connection with the head coach, too, is pretty neat. And so, you know, I love that moment for, for Cam and his family. And I'm not going to lie to you, when Zach Taylor called my client in the fourth round and drafted him, I probably was a little bit more emotional than that point. <laughs> but uh, still pretty cool to have uh, Zach Taylor call Cam Taylor Britt. And he also called my offensive lineman and drafted him in the fourth. So I got a lot of love for Zach Taylor right now. Hey, I told you guys back in the playoffs, I was getting on that Cincinnati bandwagon wagon for the postseason I'm staying on there I'm staying on that because I think oh, that's a fun team to watch no doubt you better believe it. I'm all aboard the Uday trade <laughs> I'm all of, I'm all about it okay so all that aside how good is this fit for Cam Taylor Britt in Cincinnati you know it's really it's a really good fit um you know they need some help in the corner position they had some guys that got exposed a little bit in the um, Super Bowl last year right and you talk about a team that's close and a team that made a run they really were able to identify like okay this is what we need this is the place we can go get it in the draft and obviously if they think they need help at corner then they go draft one in the second round he's gonna be an immediate contributor you get drafted in the top two rounds you're gonna play as a rookie it's just a matter of how much you know so so they drafted him with the intention of him being a, a pushing for a starter maybe the nickel to start or maybe pushing for that starting outside corner role too so he already, you know, is, is talking about how he can't wait to match up with Jamar Chase in practice. Does that happen a lot? Will he be going up against Jamar Chase? He will, but be careful, Rook. Be careful. <laughs> you know, everyone, everyone loves the I can't wait for a moment until everyone has a welcome to the NFL moment. Every single one. I don't care. The first round pick, Mr. Walker from Georgia, will have a welcome to the NFL moment where he gets picked up off his shoes and planted on his ass. It's just the way it goes, you know. So Cam Taylor Britt, I love the tenacity. I love your ability. But just, just understand, man, these are grown men. It's a grown men's game now, and the NFL is all about you get yours more than you get got because eventually you're going to get got. It's just the way it goes. <laughs> but how much do you think he can grow just even in practice going up against oh, yeah. the arguably Everyone, the best I mean, wide receiver in, in the NFL? Yeah, every rookie is going to grow so much because the level of competition that you face daily goes up, right? I mean, every player in the NFL was arguably the best player on their team in college. And that's why the argument of like, oh, Alabama could beat Cleveland is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my entire <laughs> life, right? Like, and, and so you have all these, these young guys that were top dogs and you come in and you're on bottom of the totem pole and it's very humbling. It's a very humbling experience, but you grow really quickly. And the ones that don't shy away from the competition and use it and take constructive criticism and can handle it are the ones that grow fast. The ones that really have a hard time are the ones that come in and are entitled and like can't take that criticism or can't handle a little bit of adversity and then all of a sudden they kind of get stuck in their own heads and it really stunts their development and well the NFL doesn't really care because guess what there's a brand new draft like next year too so you really got to take your rookie year and grow in a big way so that you can try and get on the field because when you get on the field as a rookie the chance of you having a career astronomically go up hmm. and so the whole point is to just get on the field and get that I mean experience 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 it's such a painful word to hear when you're not on the field but you just got to find a way to get in between the white lines so you can have a career and not just in and out of the league how about Samori Toure hearing his name called after everything that he's been through and I mean I did a feature on him in the spring or sorry in the fall he was on the junior varsity the JV team as a sophomore in high school was not recruited didn't have a power five offer got a partial scholarship offer from Montana has a great career there but then comes here for a year does what he does and then again does what Samori 
does, even though people doubt him, he trusts the process, and, and he gets his name called. We thought he might be an undrafted free agent and land and still make a team, but hey, getting drafted, that's got to be special for him. Yeah, I mean, you know, and talk about a guy, no combine invite, right? And um, he had a ton of 30 visits. I was hearing a lot of pre-draft buzz about um, about Toure before the draft. Was, he took so many visits, and he tested so well, and... I mean, he proved himself at the biggest level in the Big Ten. And so I think that everyone thought he might be that late-round draft to pick. And, you know, those seventh-rounders are – it's getting close to do I even want to be drafted because sometimes the, the, the fit's not great versus as a PFA – uh, priority free agent, you can kind of pick where you want to go. But there's always something to say about having the, the, the drafted in front of you, whether it's the first or the seventh. It's, it's just helpful. So, you know, I think for him, it's a great fit, and he gets to catch balls from Aaron Rodgers. I mean, how great is that? You're talking about one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time, and you got a lot of developmental receivers up there. I mean, you think about an Alan Lazard or a Valdez Scantley, guys that weren't top-notch receivers coming out of the draft, but have developed into long-time standing receivers because of getting to work with guys like Aaron Rodgers and Robert Tunyon at the tight end position. That's a very good room for him to go into and get a chance to get some great experience. So take me back to your – did you expect to get drafted? I don't know. I was – I was told I had a late round grade, but that's just a way of saying that's a way of agents. We cover our butts by saying that. Um, but, you know, I, I did not anticipate getting drafted. Um, it would have been a nice surprise, but it wasn't something I thought was going to happen. So because you just said it, you know, after those first one, two, three rounds, everybody's kind of level no matter if you get drafted or not. Mm -hmm. But there is still something about hearing your name called in the draft. Um, so. Let's talk about some of those guys and the undrafted free agent status because, and you talked about this, sometimes it's better mm -hmm. even though there's this, you know, stigma about getting your name called in the draft. Sometimes it's better for you to not have your name called so then you can get a better fit, right? Yeah, I mean, and it's hard to convince players of that, mm -hmm. right? It's easy for me from the been in it for six years and see how it works and pull myself out and put myself in the agent role and explain to a player why we think it could be better. But, you know, as a player, you still want to see your name come up across the screen and hear the dun da da pick is in, right? And so, but, like, I'll give a quick example. Austin Allen, one of our clients who we all know and love here, as, you know, he was coming to it and – he, he signed a nice free agent deal with the Giants, and there was another team, and I'm not going to say who, but there was another team that was like, we really want, we really want Austin and everything. It's like, you guys drafted a couple tight ends. Like, why, why would we send him here, right? Like, and, and I love the – every front office or every guy tries to make it seem way complicated, right? This team goes, well, you know, we just – there was nothing we could do. We just really wanted to get him here, and, I mean, we just – nothing we could do. I was like, could have drafted him. <laughs> like, it's not that hard. Like, you could have just drafted him in the sixth or the seventh. Like, it's not hard. And so you get teams that get kind of salty about, like, why we went to other places or why didn't you do this or that, you know. But when you're able to look at it and do a roster breakdown, I mean, Austin Allen's in a phenomenal situation where I have very little doubt that if he handles business, he'll be able to. They drafted one tight end in Daniel Bellinger up there, and they have no established tight end in New York. And so we were able to get him into a great fit. And that's what you hope your agent does for, for all these. I hope for Stilly's sake, and I hope for – um, Damian Daniels and, and Williams and all those guys that their agent did a great job of not just trying to get them the most money or get them the most like signing bonus, but really making sure the roster situation gives you a chance to make the team, right? If you go put yourself in a room that they drafted a, like three dudes or there's a ton of vets that have established guaranteed money, like your chances of making the roster are really slim. And now, yeah, you might've got a couple more grand on your signing bonus, but dude, you're talking about you could make 705,000 next year. Is that three grand on your signing bonus really worth worth not having an opportunity to actually make the team? Because Greg asked me last night on Sports Nightly about just, you know, if it was how disappointing maybe the day was for Austin Allen, JoJo Dome, and I said, well, just talking about Jeremiah, Austin's been like the chillest dude ever, so I think he's whatever, just tell me where I'm going and I'll go, you know, take care of my business, right? I mean, that's kind of yeah, how I mean, he's been this whole process. Yeah, and I mean, honestly, I, we all thought Austin was going to get drafted, you know, but that's just the way there, there wasn't that tight end run didn't start until late. And so there was a lot of tight ends that had draftable grades that didn't get drafted. And there was some that I drafted that blew my mind, but I won't go into that. But, you know, a guy like JoJo where he had a lot of hype coming in too and, and where you go, but, you know, the biggest thing for him is I think we talked about all the time, someone has to have a vision for JoJo Doman, right? Where is he going to fit? What does he play? What is he? And I think something that hurt JoJo is his 40 time, right? He didn't run fast enough to be considered a nickel. 
but he's also not considered big enough to be a, a true linebacker. And so he really does play that hybrid role, which there is a need for, but when you don't see him as a starter in that hybrid role, and I'm not saying he's not, but I'm saying obviously the NFL doesn't view him as a starter in that hybrid role right now, that's probably why he fell into that undrafted category. But the Colts is a great fit for him too. They've got some really athletic linebackers that they love putting in there with Leonard and those guys. So I think he'll fit in and give him, I mean, he could be a guy that plays special teams in the league for 10 years and, and becomes a special team ace too, which you can make a lot of money and a great career doing that as well. Spoken like uh, Will Compton, right? Yeah, 10-year vet, right? And he apparently, Will Compton said JoJo's going to be the only linebacker if he got drafted that wasn't going to be a bust this year. So... <laughs> <laughs> um, it, I, a couple of their Huskers landing in spots. Your guy, Ben Stilley, to Miami, right? Uh, any other, other picks jump out to you or spots? You know, Dam the thing that I was a little surprised me, um, Daniel's a guy that left early, right? Could have came back, not getting drafted. That's always kind of a, it's a kick, in the, kick in the butt when you're that guy. I mean, it happened to Nick Gates a few years ago. He's still banging the league. Is Daniel's good enough to play in the NFL? Absolutely. But... When you get to the end of draft day and you're like, man, I could have played one more year in college and maybe could have heard my name called, that one stings a little bit too. So that was a little interesting to me. That he left early, so I'm curious kind of who got in his ear and, and if he's doing all right. I hope he's fine. He does have a home, though, which is the most important thing. All you want to do is a chance to compete, right? And then you got Williams um, going up there to the Legion of Boom with Seattle, I believe, right? So you talk about a place that knows how to develop corners, develop DBs, and get a chance to go up there and, and take a shot with a team that's kind of rebuilding a little bit. So, you know, that's a good spot for him to land as well. What does it take to go now that these guys, um, you know, whether it be Samori or these undrafted free agents now, what's the process like and what does it take for them to secure a spot on a team? Yeah, so um, there's two two weekends of rookie mini camp. So the first one is this weekend. Half the teams do the rookie mini camp this weekend. The second half does it next weekend. So it gives guys that are rookie mini camp tryouts, so not priority undrafted guys, but just tryouts, two opportunities. Um, so they'll fly out either this week or next week, and you get a playbook, and you just got to start grinding, right? You're already behind, which is what I mean. They put the rookies in a bind right away. You're already two weeks behind because guys have been there at OTA starting last week or even this week. So. You're behind and you got to come and the big thing is you just got to start really just understanding hey everything i just did in the last four months is great but none of that's going to help me make the football team right like running my 40 and doing all that cool i got to be a football player i got to get back to moving point this guy from point a to point b against his will or running around this guy or whatever i have to do and you also have to do the mentality shift of i'm no longer the man right if i got to go hold the bag i got to go hold the bag if i got to run down on scout kickoff i got to run down on scout kickoff and you just find a way to make yourself valuable to that team and that looks different for every position that looks different for every player but the more you can do, the longer you can stay. So you just start trying to showcase yourself and really you're selling yourself via your play and how you handle yourself in the building to your coaches, to people around, so that come in September, you want guys standing on the table going, we can't cut this guy because he's gonna help our football team. Or, hey, we can put this guy on the practice squad because he's good enough that he's one play away to be on our active roster, but we just don't have a space for him right now, right? You just gotta find a way to stay in the league because once you're out of it, it's really hard to get back in. All right, what's next for you as the agent? Yeah, um, well, first I get to take a little bit of a deep breath here, uh -huh. right? So like I said, January through the end of April is like my season, right? Mm -hmm. It's four months. Um, so a little bit of a deep breath, but um, start working on 2023 already, right? You start trying to work on your class and start your cycle over and help your guys get settled and help them kind of transition and start helping them through the playbook and, and working with them as far as helping to get them a leg up and give them advantage. And also you start working on 2023, finding guys and starting the recruiting process for them because you do your recruiting during the summer and then kind of let them go play their ball during the fall. All right. Um, so breaking news while we're taping this podcast, another defensive line commit out of the transfer portal. So uh, to, that's they needed that, right? That was going to be uh, a yeah. big emphasis going into this summer is, is hitting that portal with defensive line. Got to make you feel good, right? Two big commits here in the, the last week. Yeah, I mean, obviously, and with the departure of Casey, that's even harder um, with a guy when that, that did leave the program. So that was already a thin group, but already can tell that the Huskers are making moves to refill that position. That was a strength of ours last year. So I think that it's good to hit that because in this league, in the Big Ten, you've got to control the line of scrimmage on both sides of the football if you want to win football games. What's next for these guys? What are they doing now? I mean, it's finals week, but what's, what's next? 
yeah, you get to go home. Right. This, this, mm-hmm. this is kind of your little bit of a, a quote unquote summer. I know a students usually have a full summer, but as a student athlete, especially with a sport, a fall sport, you get about three weeks. So they get to go home a little bit in May and regroup, see friends, see family and take a little bit of R&R. And then you come back usually around that first week in June or maybe even that last week in May and start on summer school and start the summer conditioning program because. I mean, shoot, we're going to blink here pretty quick, Jessica, and you and I are going to be sitting over in Ireland going, holy crap, we're kicking off against Northwestern. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. I can't wait. Hey, how's uh, Oliver after his debut? Is How's he handling his newfound fame? You know, he keeps saying he wants to go see the Huskers, so I got to get him back down in there. And uh, he's always putting on my Husker helmet running around here. So I think we're, we're I'm starting the, the brainwashing early for him so that it's an easy transition into Husker fandom. Got any fun family stories that we missed in the last month? You know, I think the biggest thing is uh, we're body training. So my, my son's favorite thing is he'll, he'll take a number two and then he'll go, <laughs> Daddy, look big one he's like, oh thank you son thank you so much so that's that's kind of his favorite thing to do right now so i guess get to hear about nice big poops from my son oh that's amazing all right well that is the draft recap i guess the next time we'll be we'll be taking a break here but then we'll uh, get back to it and we'll be really diving into this 2022 football season how about yeah, that i mean yeah, I mean, starting summer, there's nothing else to talk about. Baseball is boring. No one watches the MLB. So, you know, there's there's football, and then there's stuff to talk pre-football. So I can't wait, and I'm excited for the Huskers this year. All right, get some rest. Rejuvenate, Absolutely. recuperate, and uh, enjoy some time with the fam. I uh, appreciate it. Go Big Red. All right, and make sure you subscribe and like wherever you listen to uh, Never Miss Out on a Huskers Radio Network podcast. For Jeremiah Searles, I'm Jessica Cootie.